right, turn with me in your book, in your Bible, to the book of Daniel. To the book of Daniel, we're continuing our verse-by-verse exposition through this book of Daniel. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 27. As we consider the prophecy of the 70 weeks, or the 77s, Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 27, hear the word of the Lord. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O Daniel, I have have now come out to give you insights and understanding At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood and the And to the end shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we... We say with the Apostle Peter of old, where else can we go, Lord, for you have the words of eternal life. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray even as the song we sang this evening, Lord, I pray that you would show us Christ here in this passage. Lord, teach us, instruct us of Christ and that of him concerning him in this passage. Give us understanding of this passage, this passage that can be difficult at times, that you would We humble ourselves before us, before you illuminate this passage so we may understand it for your glory, for our good. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so the first Christian book I read as a Christian that was given to me was the book Left Behind. Who has ever read Left Behind book? All right, just a few of us. Come on, guys. Come on. All right, so... Not only did I read one of those books, I read 11 of those books. I don't know how many ended up coming out, but I read, by, I read all the ones that were out up until the time that I was reading them. So I read 11. These books are like 300 pages. I mean, these are like thick books. I read 11 of those books in high school in a matter of months. I mean, I, it's got to be like one book a week. I was reading like, I mean, once I got one of them, I couldn't stop reading them. I was engrossed in them and in, in, in in the story that it was painting. And if you have read the books, you know it's a fictional account of what would happen in the final days according to what the authors believe that the Bible teaches. I mentioned this book series because the authors, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, their interpretation of this passage right here, Daniel chapter 9, specifically verses 24 through 27, heavily impacted and shaped what they believed would happen in the last days. For example, in their reading of this passage here, verses 24 through 27, they believe that that 70th week, that last week mentioned here at the end of chapter 9, represents the last seven years here on earth. These seven years will be seven years of great tribulation, and it would be these seven years in which the rise of the Antichrist would happen. And in the first half of these seven years, the Antichrist will fool God's people in believing in him. And he will actually get a temple built that will bring in the the sacrifices. And then in the last three and a half years, he will bring a terrible persecution upon God's people. 
And this belief that was written down in this fictional account of this book called Left Behind, this belief came specifically from their interpretation of Daniel chapter 9 here in verses 24 through 27. And almost solely from this passage. There's a couple other passages, primarily the Olivet Discourse, but outside of that, it's primarily this passage where they find that, that teaching. This is why some Christians have said that this passage in Daniel chapter 9 is one of the most important passages in all of the Old Testament. For example, Pastor John MacArthur says this. He says, this is the most important prophetic passage in all of the Bible, the one here. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. He goes on to say that this text is, is the backbone of Bible prophecy. Now, my contention this afternoon is that many have overblown the significance of this passage as it relates to the end times. I do think it's important and significant as all prophecies are, but not in the same way that Tim LaHaye or John MacArthur might believe it to be so. For as we look at this passage, hopefully you'll see that the main point of this passage is that the Babylonian captivity will not be the last tribulation for God's people. There's more to come, but even more so, there's a greater liberating event than that of the, of the release of the Babylonian captivity, and that's the coming of the death of the prophesied Messiah. Therefore, I believe the emphasis of this passage is not necessarily end times per se or, or specifically the Antichrist. But instead, the emphasis of this passage is actually the coming of the Christ, the Messiah, and his sacrificial death for his people. Gabriel gives Daniel this insight of what is to come. And that insight is about the prophesied Messiah that he will come. And not only will he come, but he'll actually die for his people. And this is really the greatest news any Old Testament saint could hear. This is the greatest news Daniel could ever hear. How encouraging this news would be for him. I mean, in fact, if you look out, if you look throughout all of scripture, Daniel really plays a, a unique part. I mean, he, he is chosen by God, in which God reveals to him this future of the Messiah's coming and the Messiah dying. I mean, Isaiah gets that in the suffering servant, but even more explicitly, Daniel gets it here. So before we jump ahead, let me give you the, the game plan for this afternoon. First, I want to look at God's speedily response to Daniel's prayer. That's in verses 20 through 23 as Gabriel comes swiftly. And then I want to spend the rest of our time looking at this prophecy of the 70 weeks or the 77s and in verses 24 through 27, again, the goal of this passage is, is to be an encouragement to you because that's really what Gabriel was bringing to Daniel. He was bringing a word of encouragement to him. And I hope it's an encouragement to us as well. The goal is not for y'all to be confused, but to be encouraged by the end of this, this afternoon. First, let's look at God's just quick response to Daniel's prayer in verses 20 through 23. The Bible says this. While I, Daniel, was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out. And I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. So first off, what do you notice about the timing of God's answer to Daniel's prayer? It's while Daniel was praying. Now, what does that mean? That means while Daniel was praying, God already answered his prayer. Daniel didn't even have time to finish his prayer. By the time he, was, he hadn't even finished God had sent Gabriel, the angel, to come to him to give him insight and understanding. If you remember from Daniel's prayer in verses 1 through 19, he was primarily praying for God to fulfill this prophecy. This prophecy to his people found in Jeremiah that the Babylonian captivity would come to a close, would end. Remember, Daniel was reading Jeremiah and saw that this Babylonian captivity should only last for 70 years. And Daniel knew that these 70 years were coming up because guess what? He had been there for all 70 years. 
And before we look at what Gabriel says to Daniel initially, notice even these first few verses here in this passage, the temple language. Daniel was praying before God for the holy hill. The holy hill would be where the temple stood. Remember, there is no temple at this point. And then Daniel said, Gabriel came to him at the time of the evening sacrifice. Now, why is that interesting? The evening sacrifice was a certain time. It was late afternoon, but it was the time in which the evening sacrifice would go into the temple. It's fascinating. Daniel, even 70 years in captivity, was still keeping record of time by way of the temple. Even though there had not been evening sacrifices for 70 years, he said, you know, Gabriel came during the time of the evening sacrifice. He could have just said Gabriel came in that late afternoon instead of the time of the evening sacrifice. He's, whenever he's praying, he has his head towards Jerusalem, towards the holy hill. Now, I think we just see the steadfastness of Daniel just once more. Even 70 years of captivity, he has not forgotten God's promise to his people. So it highlights Daniel's faith. And this is important because this vision, this prophecy given to Daniel is significant because no one else in all of the Old Testament gets as much of a detailed description of the coming of the Christ and what he will do when he comes than Daniel here. So it's a pretty amazing prophecy, but it's given to a man of great faith. Gabriel then tells him in verse 23 that Daniel is greatly loved by the Lord. And now that he's about to receive this vision and prophecy that will be, be a great encouragement to him in his old age. So that's God quickly comes and comes to Daniel after his prayer. And then next, let's look at verses 24 through 27. This is Gabriel's vision and prophecy given to Daniel of what is to come. What will happen after the end of the 70 years of Babylonian captivity? And the answer is the 70 weeks or 77's prophecy found here in verses 24 through 27. This is the, the prophecy that's pretty, pretty debated by many scholars. Let me read this section aloud and then we'll walk, walk through it slowly. Beginning in verse 24, this is Gabriel giving this prophecy to Daniel. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to a Tone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It shall make a, he shall make a, it shall come with a flood, and to the end shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. All right, so before we jump in, I want to be clear. I'm not naive enough to think that my interpretation is going to be completely right this, this afternoon. The reason is because this is a difficult passage. No matter what others may say, no matter how much confidence someone has when they come to this passage, there's much difficulty here. I'm not going to die on the heel of whatever interpretation I preach on this, 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 this afternoon. If you come down with a different conclusion on the big picture, on the small picture, it's okay. You may actually be right. But I think a passage like this, we all need to come to it with great humility. We should come to all of the Bible, all of the Bible with humility, but especially this one, knowing that there's great difficulties here in its interpretation. Now, with that said, I am called as your pastor to preach this passage to you, so I got to preach it preach my conscience and the result of my study of it. All right, so let's dig in. Remember, the prayer of Daniel in verses 1 through 19 of this chapter were all about the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. And Daniel was praying that God would bring 
would fulfill that prophecy. Those 70 years in his calculations were coming up. And he was praying, God, fulfill this prophecy. Bring this captivity to an end. And guess what? Soon after this prayer, within a year after this prayer, God would do that. For the captivity would end within a year of this prayer when the Persian king Cyrus would give a decree for the Israelites to return back to Jerusalem. However, with that said, the answer Gabriel gives here in this passage isn't in reference to the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. But instead of some future events, at least hundreds of years in the future. And this is really something that almost all Christians believe to be the case when it comes to an interpretation of this passage, especially verses 24 through 27. Almost all Christians believe this prophecy is related to something way after the time of God's people being freed from Babylonian captivity. And that's, one of, that's actually one of the many agreements. As we come to this passage, there's actually a lot of agreements among Christians when it comes to, to this passage. That's one of the agreements. Most people believe this passage is not referring to the 70 years of tribulation of, Bab of Babylonian captivity, but that which will happen later in the future. Gabriel begins by saying there's a decree made about God's people in the holy city, not by Cyrus, but by God. And it's 70 as well, but 70 weeks. You see that verse? 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. And here again, most Christians agree on the interpretation of what 70 weeks is most likely best translated as 77s. Really, the Hebrew word is sevens, not weeks. So many believe that this 77s is a 70 times 7. So think not 70 weeks, but think 70 times 7, which is 490. And many people believe, again, this is Probably the majority of Christians agree that these 490 is most likely not days or weeks, but years. All right, so even Paul is there. So that 70 weeks, most Christians, most Bible scholars interpret that 70 weeks as a 70 times 7, and not just 70 weeks meaning months, but 70 times 7 as in years. It's going to be close to 490 years, but that last 7th week is where it gets a little tricky. But we'll get to that in a little bit. But for the most part, many people see this 70-week period at least being a few hundred years. And that's, that's most of Bible scholars. So that's something that there's not much disagreement on. But within these 77s, at least these hundreds of years, a few things will happen, we're told in this passage. Sin will be put to an end. You see this in verse 24. Trent, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a holy place, or I think a better interpretation, a holy one. So we see all of those things will happen within this 77s. And all of those are important, right? Sin is going to be put to an end within this time period. Everlasting righteousness will be brought in. And the anointing of the Holy One, the Messiah, will happen. Those are all huge events that will happen within this time period, wherever these 77s, as we'll look at, however long this time period will be. And that's great news. Think about Daniel's asking, just when are you going to free us from physical captivity? God's response with Gabriel is, you think freeing you from physical captivity is great. Sin is coming to an end. Your sins are going to be atoned for. Everlasting righteousness is coming. See how that's way greater news than Daniel even asked for or could wonder? So Gabriel's responding, yes, those 70 years of captivity, they're coming to an end, but it's going to be even better. Sin is coming to an end one day, Daniel. What a wonderful promise for Daniel to hear. What a wonderful promise for any of God's people to hear in that day. And then verses 25 through 27, we're given a division and description of the 77s. And again, for the most part, these, these first 69 sevens, so to speak, most Christians are in agreement on. 
So we won't spend too much time there. It's that last seven, that last 70th week, so to speak, where there's a lot of disagreement, and rightfully so, because it's, it's, it's a difficult one to decipher. But let's begin. Let's begin with those first two sections of the 70 weeks. First, there's the first seven years, or the first seven sevens, which is the beginning of verse 25. Look there with me. At the verse 25, we're told this. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Well, before we look at that, there's three divisions we're told in this passage. There's the first seven weeks, and there's the seven sevens, and there's the 62 sevens, and then the last seven. So we're going to look at this first, this first uh, seven sevens. And we're told in this first seven sevens that there will be a going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince. There shall be seven weeks. Again, here, most Christians agree on the time frame that these first seven sevens is actually seven times seven, 49 years. And it takes place right after the decree of King Artaxerxes, one of the kings of Persia, who decrees for Nehemiah and the Israelites to rebuild the temple. This was around 453 B.C. There's a few different dates. Uh, this could be the decree given by Ezra. Some have seen it as 445 B.C. But I think the best date is probably 453 B.C. That's the word going out to restore and to build Jerusalem. So you can say the beginning of the 77s is around 453 B.C. If you think about it, I mean, that's, that's, that's like over 100 years after, the, after the God's people were freed from the Babylonian captivity. So this is far in the future from what Daniel was even asking for. So the first seven sevens is the word going out to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. Think specifically the rebuilding of the temple by Ezra and Nehemiah. But in this, in this verse 25, there's a phrase of the coming of the anointed one, the prince. The Hebrew word here for the anointed one is the Messiah. I think this is actually a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah of the Lord Jesus. Not that Christ would come in this first seven sevens. He didn't come in those 49 years. He didn't come in the 400s B.C. But if you really look at the grammatical structure here in this verse, it could simply be making the point that the Messiah will not come until after the temple is rebuilt. Now, you may ask, well, why, why is Gabriel mentioning the Messiah early on in this first seven sevens in these, these, these 49 years in the 400s B.C.? The reason, as we'll see as we walk through this passage, is that this prophecy, again, is mainly about the Messiah. It's not about primarily the Antichrist or someone else. It's about the Messiah from the first seven sevens all the way to the final 70th week all of it is mentioned in reference to the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. These 77s are all about Christ and his coming and his death. So here in verse 25, I think the best reading of it is that the Messiah will not come until the temple is rebuilt in Jerusalem, which is true. Right now, some have read that this some interpret that the anointed one is maybe King Cyrus or King Artaxerxes. That could be the case, but I don't, think, I don't think it is, as you'll see later in this passage. But I think the best interpretation is that this anointed one, this Messiah, is the Messiah, is Christ. And think, here we have Gabriel proclaiming to Daniel of the coming of the Messiah. So the Messiah won't come right after the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Maybe that's something Daniel thought. But Gabriel is saying, no, the Messiah will not come until after the temple is rebuilt. So that's the first seven sevens. Those first 49 years, you could say the word went out. The emphasis was that the temple would be rebuilt and the Messiah would come afterwards. Then there's the second group of sevens, which is the largest group, the 62 sevens. And that's described at the end of verse 25. Look, look at that one with me. It says, then for 62 weeks, or 62 sevens, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. All right, so not much is said concerning this time other than that the temple is built and there will be troubled times. If we take these sevens to be years, that means 62 
Sevens equals 434 years. So there will be 434 years of the temple standing and being used for the sacrificial system. So those are the first 69 sevens of the 77s of Daniel's prophecy. And if you try to add them all up, you got 453 BCs when the word goes out. That's the beginning of the first seven sevens. Plus 49 years, which is the seven sevens, seven times seven. Plus 434 years, which is the 62 sevens. Hopefully you're following me. I know there's a lot of numbers I'm throwing out there. Okay, just trust my math, I guess. So that's 453 B.C. plus 49 years plus 434 years. And what comes out after those 69 weeks is 30 A.D. Up until this point, I think all Christians agree with what, what I've just said. Most people say this is probably the right interpretation outside of the anointed one being the Christ. Some people say the anointed one is uh, a political figure like Cyrus or, or, or Xerxes. But all the other parts, it's pretty much most Christians are in agreement on. So I'm not giving you anything too crazy with all these numbers. But that brings us to the 70th seven, the last week, the 70th week. And this is where it gets crazy. Okay, this is where just there's, there's most people start diverging in their interpretation. And it's here we have to notice the difficulty of this prophecy. We're told this about the 70th week, or the 70th seven, in verses 26 through 27. It says, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end shall there be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. All right, so here's the 70th week, the 70th seven of Daniel's prophecy. And there are just a host of number of different interpretations of this passage. I won't go through them all. But the most prominent one, which is the one that was really my default by reading the Left Behind series, is probably maybe most of all of our default positions of the final 70th seven, which is that final 70th seven is the last seven years of human history. The seven years of great tribulation. Who has ever heard that interpretation that this last 70th week, 70th seven is the seven years of great tribulation at the end of human history. Okay, I think that's probably most of our default positions. That, that was my position um, when I first became a Christian. So you, you have that. Um, and that interpretation of this passage, those seven years are going to be primarily about the rise of the Antichrist, um, that he will, in the first half of those seven years, he will rebuild the temple and God's people will, you know, you know, before him, so to speak. And then in the second half of those seven years, the second three and a half years, the Antichrist will reveal himself to be the Antichrist and he will desolate the temple that he has rebuilt in those final years and bring great tribulation, even worse tribulation, upon God's people. So again, who has heard that, that interpretation before, those seven years of great tribulation? Okay, I think many, many of us have. Now, this is probably the dominant position among Christians today, I would, if I had to guess. However, this view is actually pretty new when it comes to church history. It's just, it's just only come about in the last couple hundred years or so at the earliest. And the difficulty of this passage is that no one interprets this last sevens, the 70th seven, as happening right after the 69th sevens as if it was just another seven years, like the other 69 sevens of years. No one interprets it that way. Because if you interpret this 70th week, the 70th seven of years, like the other 69, because the other 69, we just saw them as all happening right after each other for 69 times seven, for however many years we calculate it. 
but no one interprets it that way. If you interpret it that way, then the end of the 70th week would be 37 AD. And I don't think, uh, I know no one who interprets this passage as the 70th, as the 77th end on 37 AD. So with that said, everyone treats this 70th seven, this, this last seven years, everyone treats it differently from the first 69. So that's just, I want to make that clear. So everyone treats it a little bit differently. Your dispensationalists, kind of like your, your left behind folks or like a John MacArthur type, they just believe there's a huge gap in between the 69th sevens and the 70th sevens. So they jump from 30 AD all the way to the very end of the world, and those last seven years is a 70th seven. Your partial preterists believe that these 70th sevens stretch to 70 AD, and that's the end of, end of it. And then there's probably all in between or different other interpretations. But that's the problem. The 70th week, the 70th seven is just not like the others. No one interprets it like the other 69. It's similar to how when we got to the fourth beast. You remember interpreting, looking at the four beasts a few chapters ago. Remember we looked at the first three beasts and everything just went pretty smooth. And then we came to the fourth beast and we we're like, yeah, this is, this is strange. This is very hard to interpret. Similar here, it's like the first 69, you're kind of tracking, and then you get to the 70th one, and you're just like, you know, what are we to do with this? It seems it's, it's different. So I think, I think there's a, a theme going on here, as you see through the book of Daniel. With that said, let me take a stab at what the 70th seven, the 70th seven years means. I believe the 70th week begins with the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Think around 30 A.D., However, I think the beginning of verse 26 and the beginning of verse 27, I think both of those are referring to the same event. Let me read both of them, the beginning of verse 26 and then the beginning of verse 27. I think both of them are referring to the same event. This might help you. It helped me. We're told this in, at the beginning of verse 26. An anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And then we're told this at the beginning of verse 27. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. So therefore, we're told here in this passage that halfway through the 70th week, 70th seven, which ultimately, I think you have to take it, well, some will take it literal by the last seven years of human history. But I will take it symbolically, not a literal seven years, but halfway through it, we're told the Messiah will be cut off. Anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. That for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. Remember, this whole prophecy is not about the Antichrist or even the temple. I believe it's about the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. We're told the anointed one. Again, the, the Hebrew word here is the Messiah will be cut off and shall have nothing. So you go back to Daniel's prayer. He was wanting an answer about the temple. It's like, when will this captivity end? And we'll go back to be in the temple and the temple will be rebuilt. God answers him through Gabriel and tells him of his plan, which is far more wonderful than the rebuilding of the temple. He tells him that he's going to send the Messiah who's going to end all sacrifices and offerings once and for all. You know, in the Lord's providence, we just looked at that this morning in Hebrews chapter 10. Remember the sacrifices and offerings didn't please the Lord to bring delight to them, that they were just shadows of the substance of what is to come, and that substance is Christ's body. I think this is what Gabriel is telling Daniel. He's almost giving him a little bit more light than most people when it comes to the shadows of the old covenant. So the vision Daniel is receiving is that of the substance of the shadows. But he's still, he's still receiving it in a vision, so it's still a little shadowy. But here Daniel receives a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. But we're told that when he comes, he'll be cut off. See that in verse 26. An anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. 
Think Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. The Messiah will come, and instead of ruling and reigning, initially he'll come and he'll suffer. He'll be cut off from the land of the living. And then notice the language of, of covenant in verse 27, which, again, I think is referring to the Messiah. This is where you have so many different interpretations. Every, he, every person in verses 26 and 27 is disagreed upon on who it is. Some believe verse 27, all of it is speak, speaking about the becoming Antichrist, but I actually think the first part of verse 27 is speaking about Christ, not the Antichrist. I know that's, that's such a complete opposite interpretation, but this is Daniel chapter 9. But I think if you go to Daniel chapter 27, beginning of 27 is similar language. It's saying the same language at the beginning of verse of 26, but a little bit different. He says, and he, I think this is the anointed one, the Messiah, shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. Because this is what the Lord Jesus did when he was cut off. The chosen one, the Messiah, when he was cut off, he put an end to sacrifice and offering because he was the once and for all sacrifice. And notice the language of covenant in verse 27. The Messiah will make a strong covenant with his people. And this word covenant is not a new covenant. It's basically like a ratification of a covenant that's already been made. I mean, this is what we've been going through in the book of Hebrews. This is a ratification of God's covenant of grace. This is the new covenant made with Christ's blood for his people and his death. And then I think the end of, I think the end of verse 26 correlates to the end of verse 27. I think they're probably similar events. Look at the end of verse 26 with me. Then we're told this, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And then jump to the end of verse 27. I think, again, they're telling the same story. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. I think both of these passages, the end of verse 27, end of verse 26, and the end of verse 27, are both referring to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, when the city and temple are destroyed. That temple in which Daniel is saying, I can't wait to return back to it and to have it rebuilt. God is saying, an even greater tribulation is coming that's way worse than the Babylonian captivity. That temple that will be rebuilt after those you know, 60, after those, you know, 77s or wherever the case may be, the temple will be destroyed. It will be destroyed by the Roman general Titus. And I believe this is what the Lord Jesus taught in his Olivet Discourse, that the fulfillment of this prophecy of the abomination of desolation was the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. I think that's when Jesus referred to Daniel and says, let the readers understand when he mentions the abomination of desolation, he's referring to that was about to happen in just a few decades as he was pointing to the temple and saying that this prophecy will be fulfilled. Now let me add this. The covenant the Messiah made with his people was for one week. Therefore, and that one week is one sevens, which is that whole 70th sevens. Therefore, I'm of the persuasion that we're still in the 70th week, the 70th seven. I believe the 70th week comes to an end when the Lord Jesus comes back, just as he is described in Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man riding on the clouds with glory. And I think that makes sense because if you start adding up all the years, you start thinking of all the different numbers. You know, there's the year of Jubilee. The ultimate year of Jubilee comes at the end of 70 sevens. That great year of the release of all those in bondage, the great year of jubilation we see in the Old Covenant. And the 77s means this is the Jubilee of Jubilees. And I think that Jubilee of Jubilees is when Christ returns back as he has promised. And that might not answer every question you have about this passage, but that's, that's what I think is probably the best interpretation here. So what's the big takeaway? Well, the big takeaway is this, the emphasis of this passage, again, is not the temple. It's not the Antichrist. I don't think it's referring to the Antichrist here. 
Now, again, that doesn't mean this passage doesn't set forth a pattern that might happen at the end of human history. That the, the Antichrist will, will look like what's described here in ways at the end of human history. That could be the case. The, the Bible definitely works in patterns. But the big takeaway is that this passage is all about the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. This is our hope. It's Christ. And I think this was the, what was needed for Daniel. He might have been putting too much hope in, in, his, in the temple being rebuilt and Gabriel saying, no, our hope needs to be the Messiah. And we, should, we shall not fear what's to come. Not the Antichrist, not the four beasts, because Christ has come and he has already put away sin. And we're told here that he is going to bring an everlasting kingdom of righteousness in these 77s. When he returns at the end of the 70th seven, at the end of human history as we know it, on the Jubilee of Jubilees, Christ will usher in kingdom of righteousness. Now, one more thing I want to mention. So Gabriel comes up in the book of Daniel, you know, in chapter 8, then here in chapter 9. Do you know the next time he comes up? In the gospel accounts. And guess what he's proclaiming then? He's not talking about a temple. He's not talking about the Antichrist. It's almost like every time Gabriel comes on the scene, he's proclaiming the Messiah. He comes on the scene and he tells Mary, the Messiah. You will be the mother, the Messiah, the son of David, the savior of the world will come through you. And I think that's basically a message he told Daniel. He said, the Messiah is coming. And then he tells Mary, the Messiah is coming. It's just a lot closer. We're getting to that, that final week. So that's the, that's the big takeaway. So may this be an encouragement to you as it was to Daniel in his day. And for us, we're on the other side of the cross. We get to see the glory of the cross. I mean, when Daniel first heard this, I can only imagine what he was thinking. Okay, the Messiah is coming. He's going to be cut off and have nothing. You know, what, what in the world? There's desolation, abominations, temple is going to be destroyed. But then there's everlasting righteousness, end of sin. What is going on? Well, on this side of the cross, we, we can see it all. That the Messiah was cut off so that we would not be cut off, so that we would be healed and it was by being cut off he can bring in the everlasting kingdom of righteousness. And we're now on this side of the cross, meaning we're still looking forward. Again, in, in my interpretation, which again could be wrong, is that we're still looking forward to the end of this time, the 70th seven. We're looking forward to the, toward to the time in which Christ comes back and ushers into this, in this everlasting kingdom of righteousness. And may that be what's on our heart's mind. You know, maybe we need the same correction Daniel might have needed which his hope was in something that may have not been in Christ. It might have been in the temple and the people and the national people and all these things. But may we be corrected. And that our hope is not in this nation or in this church, but that our hope is in Christ and in Christ alone. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once more for your word. Lord, I pray that you would take your word now and that if there was anything spoken of that is that is false that is not true lord that it that you it would not um that your people would not receive it lord that you would take your word and accompany it by your holy spirit and take that which is true and use it and mold and shape your people this afternoon and lord that you would remind us of this wonderful truth of the messiah the chosen one the anointed one has come Christ has come. He has been cut off for our sake. He has died so that we might have eternal life. And Lord, what a great hope this is. And may you remind us that this is not just a, a hope of what's happened in the past, but that this is a hope of the future, that Christ will return. The Son of Man will come riding on the clouds of heaven at the trumpet call and receive us all into his everlasting kingdom. We pray that you would keep this on the forefront of our hearts. And Lord, that we would pray and look forward to the day in which Jesus would come. So come, Lord Jesus, quickly. In Christ's name.